So we're from cows too, dude. Okay, cows, dude. Oh, I feel like that was quite a sense of movement. Yeah, but that okay enough to start to go I'm pretty sure. Well, Alright, so do you want to switch to the five minutes and five minutes. Uh, are we to start Yeah, i to turn off the lights. Woo! Yeah, Okay, so we need more RGB LEDs. Oh, yes. <laughs> Better. 
Welcome everyone to uh, all right, internet, we're starting. Be quiet. No more talking about Elon Musk, TJ. <laughs> What's up? Podium lights. It could be. I'm not sure. I mean, actually, this is probably, if anything, a lot worse. This isn't that bright. Okay. Uh, but it, it, it's a cool, like, thing. Okay. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's get it. Yeah. Uh, welcome. Welcome, everybody. Wait, what? Who is this speaking? All right. I just want to say welcome, everyone, first um, to our um, 600 and... I have no idea what... 600 what five what? I have no idea what 5 moth this is, but welcome to 5 moth um, We are going to do basically five-minute presentations. Um, I will... Internet, peanut gallery. Peanut gallery! Oh, we're muted. Mute yourself. Mute yourself. Oh, you I have no idea we're trying to... Oh, wait, hold on. Hey. hey. Uh, okay, we are we are speaking now. Hello. <laughs> Why is there a laser pointer? Somebody's pointing a laser pointer at you, dude. Okay. So, so, let's do so for. <laughs> That's literally strong. So thank you everyone for coming. Um. First, uh, Apex. Do you? Well, let's without further ado. Um, basically, everyone, we're gonna have five minutes of presentations each. Um, if anyone wants to, they can um, they can basically hook their thing up to they can log in to meet that bit that C that slash noise bridge up at the top, um, and they can share their screen, um, and then they can use. Yes, we are currently recording um, on the computer or on this computer. Um, so yeah, so you have you have multiple options. You can either plug in directly here. Um, and then you will be seen on the projector, um, or you can go on to Jitsi um, and show your screen there. Um, with that being said, our first, the first up is Apex. Security uh, case is going on up. Get up there, dude. Yeah, talk up here. Tell us about you, Robin Hood, Apex. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you, if you want to, you can plug in yours instead. Yeah. We can take that. Hey, TJ, so you should, it's recording all this, right? Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. I don't want to be on. Salute. Yeah. Okay. Can you guys online here? Can you mute your laptop? We just need to get a projector. Yeah. Leave the projector. The mic, yeah. The HDMI is transmitting some audio. There we go. So there's that there. Okay, cool. We're good. Cool. Um, oh, wait, you also had. Uh, do you have something here that you were about to display? Okay. It's on the computer, dude. Cool. Local. Okay. All right, everyone, welcome. Robin <laughs> Wow. Uh, oh, I have sunglasses. Yeah. sunglasses. <laughs> we can have, I have some sunglasses. sunglasses here. Here, I'm going to throw you sunglasses. <laughs> okay, <laughs> somebody <laughs> grab some. <laughs> <laughs> so that's security and communications at the hardware level. Um, but in going through this presentation, it's actually about something between the lines, which is like heroes of the open source community. So that's what it's really about. So there's a problem that stems from a good thing that we actually have. So we have good encryption nowadays. If we use something like Signal, it seems like no government in the world can read those messages in transit. 
But then when they get to the other device, if it's an iPhone or a MacBook or whatever, those have lots of holes. So lots of people can see what's on the screens there. So if we want to have actual privacy, we're one step from the goal. So here are some examples of just articles I, I pulled them. iPhone remote exploits. There's a lot of these places where you can sell your exploits. Freaking Jeff Bezos even got hacked. Okay, kind of a big deal. So raise your hand if you want to be hacked. And you want to have all of your messages in your phone. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, you guys are already on to you guys. We're kind of SOL. We really can't buy a product from text your phone. Someone should make a solution. I was watching a Congress talk by Will Scott, and it's called What's Left of Private Messaging. He talks about this concept that some lone open source hacker made called Tank Level Check. And the solution is you use three computers per envelope. They're connected by a data diode, which is this thing here. So you have your USB to serial connectors that go from an opto coupler that contains just like an LED facing a photo transistor. So you can send information one way, but physically it's impossible to go back upstream. So you have a source computer pointing downstream to a network computer, and a network computer pointing downstream to a destination computer. The destination and the source computer is where you do your encryption and decryption respectively. So the network computer at the top of the internet only sees cyber chips. So there's a lot going on here, but if you look for like the red malware guys, if you get an exploit on your network computer through the internet, it can't go back upstream to your net, to your source computer. It can go downstream to your destination computer, but it can't get information back out, protecting you against remote exfiltration of mm. So we made some stuff in software, and we tested the crap out of it. <laughs> so using Office Stuff components, JLD and I made a bunch of briefcases. I have one here if you guys want to do some like live demoing with actual tempo chat. And that was pretty cool. But nobody wants to use a freaking briefcase to not lose tracks for it. It means they're just going to turn the phone back. It's good out the papers. The people are open source people. Yeah. So these two guys, what do you want to talk to us? They've done like the phone about clusters. Like how open source can they be like? They miss each other's phone. How are they? Yeah, yeah. So I bet we do that. All of us in terms of anything that we're using. You miss them? Yeah. It's not just open source software, it's not just open source hardware, it's actually the economy is auditable by the consumer software. So this is a piece of me for the, the keyboard that if you can you can hold it up to the light and see it's just buttons and traces. So we want to use some of these principles we're not using. So put all that together, and this is what Ahmed and I and a bunch of other people that have helped out with the way put together. This is our phone. Wow. Like I said, this is really about open source heroes. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, Moxie Mom's like, give away encryption for free. And you gave away that phone for free. Might be gave away some phone shot for free. Right? And then also a bunch of tanker spaces that made possible to work on this, you know, as the project. Like Vancouver X space, JLD, second phone on the ground, you get a bunch of chance. And also in privacy, I'm just to say, a lot of people contribute you'll never hear about because of privacy. So just keep that in mind. So you guys should get involved, whether it's with our project or something else. Um, Will Scott ended his talk by saying this is some of the most meaningful stuff you could possibly learn out. So we'll figure it out. Thanks. Thank you. What is the radio? Uh, what is the RF layer? Is it the I? Is it the uh, the four G? A cellular is it the something different from all of them? question. So in the middle, you can actually have any network internet that you want. Yeah. So our phone, we want to use just two micro gigahertz to connect to the local Wi-Fi, and we're going to use four. And each phone or each device, as it is, and whatever instantiation, hosts a dot .onion address web page, and that's all the infrastructure that we need. So it's just our public key that's there. Send information along. That's maybe a little quick for now. We can use, like you said, any kind of thing. But we want to keep it as available as possible. So, I mean, one Wi Fi chip, that was to be compromised. We want to use a different kit. Um, that's what we've done out in testing. Would this be using like, uh, like uh, Messenger, Facebook Messenger, or like Signal? What platform do you use? So, it's just using public key encryption. 
from my understanding, essentially what all you know, handwritten encryption is. We could use anything. We could use spin. You know, we could, I'm, I'm assuming, oh. we could put it to the starting structure. But the big problem is not the encryption, the big problem is the hardware. Oh. So we actually have lots of things we can swap in. Which is going to be another. So I guess from in the phone form factor, so it's a source and a specific computers are both using the same display, right? So this has three separate displays. It's three separate, separate computing yeah. right? So this would be your definition computer, your chat history. This is your upstream computer, your source ah, okay. input, and then this would be your network computer, which you just need to use to like log in your line with Okay, yeah, no. Okay. Um, and there's an actual physical gap in between all these computers. Oh, so, um, I guess for this like secure, secure, you, you, there's, there's an assumption that before you disconnect the computer, or like they, you don't get a source computer in a pre phone, right? Like, well, so it's a good question. First of all, it's, I think it's important to, well, yeah, so if only as secure as your source computer is current, okay. your destination computer is current, right? So that's some of the stuff we're also figuring out. What we want to do is give people automatically the visibility up to the supply chain as far as possible. So, so far, the way about it is. We can have live streams tagging people's specific phones. So you want to watch your phone be manufactured? We might do something like shift with like that VGA system file on Google or something like that. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Yeah. So I'm wondering, could this be turned into like a a phone case where the case is does this part and then your phone yes, connects so to that? I think this is a natural Eventuality with this product. Mm -hmm. So you have something that can work. It's essentially the same built into your regular smartphone. Um, that's going to take a heck of a lot of testing and development because you have this untrusted device to it, right? Yeah. An untrusted microphone, camera, and all that stuff. Um, oh, that's wow. awesome. So true. So just we're, we're choosing a bite off, you know, the standard <laughs> device is a reasonable design goal. Wow. If you used your phone as the network device, and then you had the other two in the case, yep. and then you had like a USB C kind of folds it's in. The same problem, same right? So it's on those devices that are plus. It's just, you know, it's kind of, this is cheap. Right? Yeah. yeah. So why wouldn't we just put it in hand together? Um, yeah, I mean. It's like the device is cancer, just get rid of cancer. You carry a tablet anyway, you might as well carry a trusted phone. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, and this is an ongoing stuff, right? So I don't want to take a bit of a Yeah. But thanks, keep the questions coming. And also, we have a bunch more components of like the reasonable size laptops. Um, so if anyone's interested in like making these, like, what makes sense? Yes. Thank you. Woo! All right, up next, we have we have Waz with Don't you bring the Yes. Yes. Was coming to the first thing. Surprised that you okay. Are you getting okay? All right, everyone, welcome. Wow.
Sweet. Okay, let me share screen here. This is preferences. <laughs> sure, it's so complicated. Um, unlock it. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is a trusted, trusted device right here. Right, right, right. <laughs> okay, come on. Click crawl. Let's check the trigger yeah. crawl box. Quick screen open, yes. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, you gotta be started to get it too. Now, now I have to find the website again. What are history? Oh, uh, I'm not gonna just keep rolling that tab. I'm not gonna be a. I'm not gonna be pro. Well, my screen is shared. Um. Sorry, hold on, let me share screen again. It's gonna work this time. Yes. Okay, cool. And okay, so what do we do all the docking? Okay. Okay, sweet. We're in business now. All right. So this is Arduino. I'm sure anybody here who's done any amount of hardware hacking has messed around with Arduino. Um, I've recorded the video. This is um, so I've had the privilege of uh, working with Ahmed on his wonderful project. Um, he's making these pretty sick things. I don't want to talk too much about it, but the the um, the thing is, is that we're using Arduino Studio, and um, you know we're iterating on some code, we're building it, uh, uploading it to the device, and so this is this is like what the process is for two different sketches, um, and I'm running it at double speed. Okay, um, so this right here, so I hit click compile. Let's compile the sketch. You can look at this progress bar on the right. Um, now, uh, I've actually looked into what it's doing, um, and it is actually giving me from scratch to file every translation unit from every library. Um, it does um, it, it does do some caching, so it doesn't have to do all of that from scratch, but for some reason, and it's beyond my understanding, like, it, it validates the cache. And you basically have to do this like every time you stop working. It's super annoying because this is uh, for for two of these sketches, it's going to take two minutes, right? And you don't want to sit there wait, wasting like a minute, you know, every time you want to iterate on these, these designs. And so Arduino like scales pretty well for like small projects, like you know, hey, we're doing one sketch or importing one library. But as soon as you start pulling in a bunch of stuff, it doesn't scale very well. So um, another thing about it is that, like, we're doing a lot of custom stuff, right? So we, we've got, um, we've made some, we've made some modifications to the, um, the board settings. Uh, we've got, um, we've got a bunch of libraries. You have to, like, go add the source URL to the Arduino, uh, settings and then, you know, pull in packages, make sure you install the right versions of packages. There's a lot of setup, right? And so this doesn't really lead to a reproducible build, right? Because every single person who wants to come in and work on the source code has to go through all of those steps in order to write the code. Because the Arduino code itself does not contain a list of all of its dependencies, right? It's just got the code, right? It's a directory with a .ino file, right? Um, so um, because we were running into these issues where it's like, oh, it worked on my machine, didn't work on yours, you know, oh, well, 
let's just wipe your Arduino code and start from scratch, and then okay, now it's working for a while, and that kind of stuff. Um, what I did, and we, also because I didn't like waiting for this, I came up with a a tool. I basically reverse engineered what Arduino was doing, and I came up with this tool. Um, here I'll close it out real quick. Um, basically, you check out the source code. Um, you just pull it down with Git, um, and then you go to build tooling, and then you've got these like different uh, executables here for whatever operating system you're running. So I'm on a Mac, so I'm going to run the Mac one. I click that, um, and it's going to start this up. Now it was it was really quick now uh, because that I've run this before on this computer. But if I if this is a fresh computer, what it would do is it would go grab all of the dependencies it needs. It would go grab the special board libraries, all that stuff. Goes, downloads it for you, so you don't have to go add that manually. It just does it. Um, and it doesn't do it again because it's already got a cache. It's smart enough to know what it's already has. Um, and so I've got this menu right here. It's a, it's a stupid little command line interface, um, but like it was really quick to set up, but, and it works for my needs. But basically, what you can do is you can just select whatever sketch we're working on. Right now, our project has like three different sketches here. Um, so you can go select one, and then you go, you know, upload you using USB. Um, and it'll it'll upload it. Live hardware? Okay, yeah, let's go. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so this is running an old. This is running uh, one of our other sketches. Oh, I gotta reset the board <laughs> so it it'll be able to accept, you know, programming. Is that uh, the duo? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, here, what I'm basically going to do is just load up like a Hello World from Habitrude and, you know, uh, NeoPixel sketch. I'm sure you guys have seen it before. Um, but I'm just going to go through uh, build and upload sketch. So if you look at the top, I've got the LCD test selected. So I just click that. What it's doing is it's going to do an incremental build. Um, and now it's uploading, and it goes, right? It's a lot of time saved. Anyway, that's it. Yeah. Is it? Okay, internet, we allow you to speak. <laughs> Oh, oh, is that is that Ahmed? That's not a question. That's okay. <laughs> so, Sorry, you're hard to hear, Ahmed. <laughs> <laughs> so, is this like like a drop-in replacement for any uh, in our studio compilation, or? Uh, it's not. It's not generic. Okay. okay. Um, I could make it generic, and to be honest with you, the code that I have is not like. Super complicated. I wrote the build stuff in Go. Uh, basically, all it does is it just does what Arduino does: it scans libraries, gets a, a manifest of the source files, compiles them, that kind of stuff. Um, to make it truly generic, I'd have to like parse the Arduino board files and stuff like that, which I didn't really want to get into. Um, so it's not a super drop. It's not a super generic solution, but if you if you run Arduino and you like see what it's doing, you can just make it. It's not super complicated. Is what I'm trying to get at. I, I, yeah, I guess I was like, is this something like you could like pitch the Arduino for me? Like, check this out. It's well faster. I, I think they need to make. Um, so there's a couple. There's a couple uh, things I didn't show. Uh, one thing is that I'm not using .ino files. I'm using a .cpp file. Uh, because like Arduino does some pre-processing to your INO files um, to basically inject forward declarations of you know function calls, uh, it adds in header includes and stuff like that. So I went ahead and just did that, right? It added like four lines of code to my CPP file, um, but it also ran a lot faster because it's not running a pre-processor. Um, so that there's a trade-off there. Uh, so it isn't. It's it's basically a departure from Arduino. At this point, like, because I'm using Arduino libraries, really, but I'm not really using the Arduino build system. Mm -hmm. 
Any other? Okay, cool. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, next, I'm going to make the. Oh, look at that. I didn't realize that's a thing. Um, next, I will. Oh, <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry. It is dark. It is so uh, dark. It's cool. No, it was, it was moving the, the microphone closer to the podium because people were talking about um, online people wanted to hear. Um, so, <laughs> okay. Um, so, actually, speaking of the internet, uh, I'm going to make, uh, I want to probably save mine for a little bit later. Um, oi, oi, do you want to? <laughs> You wish to present, and I can. I can. Yes, that is you. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, I'm going to put you on the next real quick. Oh, cool! This is going to be a All right. All right. Everybody give it up for Oi Oi with uh, Lard or whatever the title of your thing was. Let's meet our, let's meet our Everybody. Oh. All right.
Are you, hey, are you trying to advance the slide? I think we still see the same slide. Oh. Yeah, we see CRISPR now. Are they? What was the previous slide? The previous slide? Yes. RNA world in One, one minute warning. We're not seeing the new slides. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, does, anyone, does anyone have any questions? Um, um, <laughs> yeah, just go, go ahead. ahead. Mm 
Anyone else? Oh, yeah. All right. Um, so two more questions. We have two more questions on uh, from the live audience. Sure. Uh, so you mentioned that like the cookie cut cutter nature of the mRNA platform was like really transformational. Like I think someone was telling me like, but you know, the first version of the vaccine was like developed in like you know a week or so, and then it was testing. But so the for I think I learned with her that like the shelf stability is like really, really bad compared to other treatments where it's like, oh, you need dry ice conditions where it's like, eventually AstraZeneca, they know that like, I think it's still using mRNA, but they like are leveraging some, you know, viruses. So I, I guess I'm wondering, is the shelf stability like an artifact of RNA, R, or mRNA technologies, or is this just like, is this specific to that, like the COVID vaccines?
Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. We, I think we're actually going to close it so we can get the next presenter. I think is Michael here. Yeah. That's it. All right. Well, you should get on the uh, COVID disinformation channel with me. It's a blast. <laughs> Who's up next? Um, Michael is up next. Yeah. With um, order and chaos. Order and chaos. Order yes. Different. Speaking of, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Think, I um, you can plug into this laptop. This is kind of so I plug this. Um, and I'm going to plug this. Oh, then you can just plug each fan in. All right. Um, so yeah, Michael, you you now have the floor. Everyone, give a good warm welcome to Michael. Well, what are you Oh, I, I flipped it. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. Hey, everyone, thanks for having me. Um, I present a research project on years now with a secretly locked goal, which is to explore a model of life that um, head towards general and universal axioms for meaning. And before I present a proof of concept for that idea, I'd like to address the obvious counter that there is no such thing as universal meaning. And it is something I agree with mostly. Like, there's no universal values or purpose in any way that's akin to universality and the laws of physics. There's nothing absolute and objective about meaning. It's always instead about something that's relative and subjective. And I found through analogous qualities and themes in different contexts that these things kind of arise and that it's more metaphysical and philosophical than it is something completely real. But I still think it's real in the way that Philip K. Dick had a divine reality, which is something that even if you don't believe in it, it's still kind of there, which is what I need to prove. And so with that, it's not like I feel this is something that should be super obscure. You need like really think really hard to notice. If anything, I feel like universal meaning should be mainly obvious uh, to the point of just being kind of folksy truisms that maybe you've heard before, but you've just never really considered like this might be way more profound than it just seems in this moment. At least that's how I look back where I started this research. So to kind of show that, I'll start with some general descriptions that might resonate or not. So one idea is that nothing exists without order. A thing needs boundaries to separate it from everything else. It needs an organized structure that brings the stability and a foundation that can endure the unpredictability of existence. Things known to stand the test of time prove themselves as respectable authorities for providing security and control. And such old things like tradition require discipline to dutifully conserve them. But then at the same time, Nothing exists with just order. Over time, things become rigid while the world changes and maybe even oppressive or tyrannical if it doesn't adapt to these things. Some level chaos is needed, though it can cause sudden, surprising disruptions and upheavals. But despite this risk, the unknown can also lead to unexpected possibilities and revolutionary discoveries that bring new visions, innovations, and freedoms. So those are two examples. I, don't know how cliche or resonant or whatever they might sound to general or vague, but that's why to make things more concrete and the point of the project is focusing more on actual philosophy and science that kind of 
bring these as examples of people just stepping into these same type of um, axioms over and over again. So time is going to go kind of quick. Looking at political philosophy of John Stuart Mill, Bertrand Russell, um, kind of contrasts this idea of a party's border stability and progress and reform. To kind of translate, you know, liberals, conservatives, tradition, progress, these things that constantly come up when thinking about politics. And how Bertrand Russell kind of sees the trade off of too much tradition, this ossification from the discipline, and too much freedom, too much individuality can lead to dissolution before conquest because no one's united enough. And those are two, it's kind of the trade off of those two types of things. And the psychology, looking at Big Five or more foundation theory, that high conscientiousness about discipline, control, plans, order. Low conscientiousness tends to be kind of seen as a negative, but in kind of neutral terms, maybe impulsive, spontaneous, looking at the possibilities and what's always changing and being flexible, which is more about maybe hunter-gatherer life than modern sitting the computer life that we have. But it has its own values, its own weaknesses, just like order does, which could be too much OCD for personality. But morality, um, heights and others look at authority about order obligations versus liberty, which is more debated one, but talks about revolution and freedom being the focus of someone's moral concern. So again, similar themes. And just to close out, there's three things I found that kind of have this pretension of the universality, which I'm going for. Uh, one of them being complexity theory, um, Kind of a computer science approach of both analyzing dynamic systems like life and how it kind of emerges. Um, and Sarah Kaufman talks about that as a compromise from structure, surprise, being too ordered and frozen or too chaotic and gaseous. And that pretty much from cells to civilization, societies, companies, there's kind of this balance that always has to go, which kind of looking at the game of life is kind of similar of these kind of specs that remain static and these explosions that kind of just go off crazy. And then there's these structures that kind of self-perpetuate being like this middle ground between these basic set of rules. Um, and then this other writer kind of brings in more everyday language of the new and innovative versus the old and status quo with complexity theory. So kind of more out there thing to close off with mythology, there's of course Jordan Peterson and uh, Soren Richard Harness looking at myths and astrology that kind of mirror this pattern. Jordan Peterson very explicitly order and chaos, if you've heard his stuff, he talks about that and has like this huge range of words, again, from what's come up, tradition, authority, what's old, discipline versus unexpected surprise, changes unknown, um, really focus on chaos being more negative, which kind of makes sense. And then in astrology, even two of the planets, Saturn and Uranus kind of mimic the same kind of clustering of keywords and themes and qualities. Not to say astrology is true, but maybe one reason people are into it is because it's kind of mirroring this really commonsensical way of understanding meaning in the world. And it seems to line up with all these other things, at least to me, looking from psychology to complexity theories and mythology. Just here's all those words. Um, so, but of course, <laughs> He, to see if it makes sense to anyone else, if I'm just like looking up a tree here, or just other ways he might have questions or to push it forward, because I just assume I'm right on this at all, of course. Recently came out an essay looking more in depth of looking at keywords and trying to make this a little more solid. And I, I ultimately see this as like a pursuit of trying to find the balancing between things that I kind of see that when it comes to these metaphysics, that there's multiple truths, there's more than just these two I looked at, and that the reason why it's so hard to come to agreements with values and things is because there's all these competing equally true things that we need to find compromises around. And like Niels Bohr, the quantum physicist said with this quote, that the opposites of the truth might be another truth. And I just see this as a useful way to kind of, you know, get out of my own one-sided perspective and have a broader look that there are many things that could be true going on. Um, yeah. So that's all. Very quick round of questions uh, for Michael. Yes. Uh, sure. So one of those two um, 
I'm sorry, forget the name. One before the astrology slide. Um, Jordan Peterson. Uh, Jordan Peterson, yes. yes. So, so, you, so you, as you say, he talked about um, chaos a little bit a lot. Ideas specifically about the relationship between chaos and all this. Um, um, I, I don't know anything about Jordan Peterson. Well, basically, he's like has this attempt to resuscitate Christianity and this idea of God being the logos, this truth that's kind of this mediating force between chaos and order. That for anything to emerge, creativity, life, goodness, that is someone has to balance order and chaos. Which he says in terms very similar to complexity theory. Like Stuart Kaufman has this book, uh, Reinventing the Sacred, where he sees this balancing of chaos and order is God emerging through the cosmos. And Jordan Peterson is pretty much saying the same thing, except with more Christian focus. I see. Uh, oh, all right. It's, uh, on one hand, I know what I want to say. On the other hand, I have to go. This is, this is one of those things that I've definitely poked against uh, for a long, long time is what is life and the meaning of us being here. And, uh, and in the end, I don't think it matters. But at the same time, what, what I think don't, doesn't matter is the, is the point that I'm trying to get to. Right? Do, I, do I know what point I'm going for when I die? Versus what you're doing, I actually, I like the, the words. It makes me think of the idea that the words that we do use with each other matter. They will bring us into chaos or bring us into structure. And, and you know, sometimes we need some chaos and sometimes we need structure. Maybe we can use some of these words subconsciously to help other people you know, like if we're in a meeting, you can use more of the structural words for Tuesday word for truth for the Tuesday meeting instead of the chaotic ones. Uh, Nick, I like that idea. I love John. I like applications like that. Cool. Thank you. All right. Uh, all right. One more. Uh, we will close off. Just an observation. There are a lot of out the shoot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Good. Read that. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Woo! Um, actually, I was actually going to do an intermission, uh, just like five minutes, because uh, everybody's kind of been sitting around for an hour, do just maybe like five minutes, and then can do. We have, I think, three. We have a few more, but yeah, we have an open slot. I'm not the video. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think we have Um, so it's not really enough for Yeah, we need to Uh, I can just keep track of this thing. I think it's just Dave. Okay. I would say, uh, I'll just keep in mind for you at the end after Farley. Okay. Uh, for those. Um, I just realized though that, uh, is there a kind of Dropbox account? I just realized that with OBS. Um, I don't know how to do audio, how to report audio up, but with OBS. Because right now, it's like, uh, can, you can you add a source? Huh? Can you add a source? Is it OBS Studio? Or yeah, it's OBS, OBS Studio. Okay, maybe add a source. Like yeah. capture, like a wall capture. That's not audio software. So, you, is the system, I think, all set? Or not? Is it? It's awesome. I don't know. It's awesome. Is it, is it, do you think it's a audio? So I'm trying to see if it, I'm just not recording the audio conference. Oh, I think of the loud conference. This is a swing. It doesn't really matter except for. It doesn't really matter except for the one. Can I choose one of them? Oh, because I haven't recorded it anyway. Yeah.
Hey, can someone on uh, uh, some of the bits you speak? Make sure I got this. Mm. Hi. Oh, okay. Right. That's good. Crap! I don't. I don't know how to talk about Al. <laughs>